I wanted to start by recognizing that while we are in cyberspace currently, those of us in Oakland, Berkeley, and Piedmont, and Emeryville, oh, and in and, and Al Albany, are on Lishan Ohlone territory. So if you'd like to uh, put your indigenous land into the chat, you could do so. I want to say thank you to our board members, Diane Walsh, Carol Hall, Nir Nil uh, Uendrum, Amy Zins, Christina McKenley, Kelly White, Nicole Carson, and all of our community partners. We have Larson and Associates, the club, the Mamahood, with US, and the Cinematic Arts and Production Club. In October 2017, the world witnessed a watershed moment when the New York Times journalists Jody Cantor and Megan Tohey brought to light years of sexual abuse allegations against Hollywood's titan, Harvey Weinstein. And the resulting expo rocked the foundation of Hollywood and ignited the Me Too movement, a global cry against sexual misconduct that was heard in every corner of society. The brave voices of 82 women echoed their personal stories of abuse, creating ripples of change that led to real workplace reforms, legal changes, and a much needed conversation around sexual harassment and violence. These collective courage was a beacon showing others that they were not alone and that change was possible. However, the path to uncovering these deeply ingrained systemic issues wasn't easy. Persuading them to, to break their silence, even though they were bound by legal constraints in fear of retaliation, but they found strength in unity and they made this brave decision to step forward together. In February, 2020, justice was served when Harvey Weinstein was convicted of rape and sexual assault receiving a 23 year prison sentence. This triumph was further amplified in 2023 when additional charges in Los Angeles and in London led to an extended 16 year sentence, proving that no one is above the law. In the wake of these trials, the entertainment industry is grappling with the harsh reality of its past and reflecting on its future. And there are many voices that disdain for the culture of intimidation that was once deemed the norm, but there are few that are in the trenches implementing change. Gabrielle Carteris is one of those brave humans that was not afraid to rock the boat and help make an everlasting change. The Me Too movement has undoubtedly made a cultural shift. However, the fight for equality, it continues and it's a fight that all of us must champion together for a safer and more equitable future in Hollywood and beyond. Tonight, I have the absolute privilege <laughs> to introduce an influential force in the entertainment industry. Gabrielle Cateras has shaped the industry as president of the IFA and the past president of SAG-AFTRA, where for more than five years, she headed the union for over 160,000 actors recording artists, dancers, broadcasters, and helped drive the pivotal SAG and AFTRA merge. She became a household name by playing Andrea Zuckerman on Beverly Hills 90210, which we all loved. Her versatile acting career includes work in television, film, stage, including roles on We Own This City, NCIS, Criminal Minds, and so many more. A survivor of serious onset injury, Safety has been a priority for Gabrielle. She later, um, she formed the President's Blue Ribbon Safety Commission, which had also advocated for intimacy coordinators to be on set. And Gabrielle is a board member of the Solidarity Center and the largest US-based international worker rights organization. It strives to attain safe and healthy workplaces, fair wages and greater equity. She is also a founding ambassador of Reframe, an initiative of Women in Film and Sundance Institute to further gender parity in the media industry. And in 2017, Kateris was appointed commissioner to the Hollywood Commission on Eliminating Sexual Harassment and Advancing Equity. Additionally, recognized for her fight against sexual harassment and pursuit of equity, she received the SAG-AFTRA George Hiller Memorial Award in 
2019. Terrace leadership remains a powerful beacon in the entertainment industry and throughout the world. It is my honor to introduce such an exceptional human and friend, Gabrielle Cateras. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Welcome. Thank you. That's very kind, Julie. Thank you. So, so nice to be with everybody. I can't believe we're having this discussion still today, though. I have to <laughs> right? My oh, phone, my gosh. But... Well, I, I have a few questions before we open up to the audience. And, um, you know, you've been such a fierce advocate against sexual harassment in Hollywood. And looking back at the Harvey Weinstein trials and their aftermath, um, how would you say those events have been pivotal in addressing this issue that is still going on? First of all, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I, you know, I, I think that, well, clearly it was a very pivotal moment in our history. I always say it was kind of like the bomb that went off. It's not, it was simmering for centuries and decades. And he, he really became the, the focal point of that moment. But um, a lot has really come from it in a good way. I think that there's been really great strides in our industry not only in our industry, but I'm also, you know, on the AFL-CIO, American Federation of Labor in Washington, and I see it in the workplace. A lot of the things that we implemented during the time of Harvey Weinstein and our courageous members who spoke out, really spoke out about the atrocities. Um, but all of what was set up is stuff that's been repeated through different organizations in different, uh, different workplaces, and also something that's affected on a global level, our industry. So, I mean, it's that's really profound. When you think of it, though, what happened with Harvey Weinstein, that had been going on for a long time before um, the moment when, you know, people who were really well known came out in a unified voice uh, to say something. And it's striking to know that a lot of people said things to the people they work with and how much that was put under the carpet. Right. That was. So I, I think that it was a very important moment. It was a pivotal time when it happened. And I remember that was just when I got into my presidency and I was at the SAG Awards and I said, this is uh, not just a moment in time, it must be a movement. And um, in, if, if, if it is a movement, that means it's something that goes on and on for quite a long time. To change systemic issues takes years and years. And when everybody said, oh my God, we're so it's so great now we've exposed it it's going to stop and I thought oh no 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 the work has just begun and um, it's really true the work has still is going on and it's so there have been great changes there have been really great things we've been able to implement in the industry to help create a, a, a feeling of uh, a safer uh, environment but in truth um, I think there still can be more and it will be something that we have to go you know, ongoing, a lot of, not only, you know, when the Harvey Weinstein uh, explosion occurred, I think that it released something that was really important, but also it, um, it felt really wild, right? There was so many people speaking out who had never spoken out and suddenly people were losing their jobs, but they weren't necessarily being uh, given the, the due process that, you know, is really important. And so, I, I think that there was, we went to, from one extreme to another, and now maybe I'm hoping that we're coming into the center more and that we can really make change so it doesn't occur rather than just looking back. I'm hoping that we can really set something now so we have a stronger future. That's very well said. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think having so many women come together um, and support each other Oh. it's it's just so important you know as someone at the forefront of the movement you know like you're saying you've witnessed so much of this firsthand um this system this the systemic shift in hollywood after the me too movement took hold can you share your thoughts on how this has affected the way we perceive and discuss power dynamics in the industry i think it's interesting i mean i think we're acknowledging power dynamics you know, that was something that was not really acknowledged before. So that in itself is an important shift. And acknowledging those power dynamics also has created um, a different way that people are speaking to each other on sets. Whether you're talking about a director, producers, you know, whether it's the crew, whether it's the lead actor, 
to an actor who might be a day player or an extra. There is a there is an understanding and a uh, language that's really being brought forward saying this is inappropriate, this is appropriate. There are actually, they're doing trainings before you start shows, you know, it used to be only a few of the people would get the, uh, you know, sexual harassment, um, you know, meeting before the, you know, what you're not supposed to do and don'ts, safety yeah. protocols before uh, a show. And now they're including everybody in it. So I think it's, uh, there's been some really great changes that way, but we see it that the power dynamic doesn't only happen on set. The power dynamic, I think what we really recognized was even in the hiring process or before that that power dynamic for people who can hire. And we actually worked on changing laws as a result of that because our contracts only deal in SAG-AFTRA, our contracts only deal with when we are on set and you have the job. But there's a lot of power dynamic play going on before you have the job. And that desire to really work is so important. And people feel like, I mean, when I talked to some of the really, really well-known people who went and came forward and I said, did you ever like report it to the union? And what they said was, well, no, I, I told my lawyer, I told my agent, they told me that, you know, look, just, you got to suck it up. That's what, you know, he's known for this or he's known for that or whatever, but realizing that there's a whole power dynamic with the people we hire. I mean, the people who we work with who tell us, you know, even for me, when I was younger, I remember I did a show and that my agent said to me, and it was a female agent. And she said to me, uh, you know, Gabrielle, why didn't you like dress a little like, you know, sexier? Because, you know, that that would have been better for the role. I said, well, that wasn't the character, but we get that feedback in every way. And that power dynamic plays for us across the board. So I, I think that there's been major shifts. I know there have been, I know that we have major shifts because we've really started to have the conversation, you know, really yeah. communicating is freedom. So that we have a lot to work on. Freedom. I love that. Yes. So you cannot, if you have to talk, you have to, you have to talk. You can't, you can't be afraid. I remember we would typically most women and, and I still have caught myself doing it. We do this. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, you, you giggle something off that's completely inappropriate, you know? And so right, it's you're supposed to be a survivor, right? How about women who, cause a lot of this, when this came up for me, it wasn't just what happened with men, but how some of the women, particularly who've been around for a long time. And they, the, some of the philosophy of older women who have been in, around saying, uh, look, nobody was there to help me. Yep. Suck it up. Suck it up. Because, you know, I, I took care of myself and you better do it too if you want something to happen. So it's a very, we need to take care of each other. We need to tell each other the truth and we need to lift each other up and know that uh, it takes a village and we are that village. Yes, women need to help each other a hundred percent. They really do. They need to be each other's advocates. Um, I, I know that you were appointed commissioner to the Hollywood Commission on Eliminating Sexual Harassment and advancing equity uh, equality during the um, Harvey Weinstein uh, scandal. It, that really shows your commitment during you know, that time to the cause, but also you continue with everything that you're doing. Can you talk about some of the um, critical initiatives that have been effective bringing about that change um, and the Me Too movement? So maybe some lot, right? First of all, I was a delegate on the commission, right? So oh. that was a commission and I was a delegate in the commission representing uh, SAG-AFTRA. But um, you know what? We've had a lot of issues that we've put forth. First of all, when it first came up, we realized that we needed to have um, um, standards, guidelines to put forward. And we needed to be having agreements. One of the issues that we knew was really important was um, the fact that because in auditions like hotel rooms and all, you know, where things were sometimes occurring where you should never have to be in a room alone, right? With a man in a, particularly a hotel, we actually created guidelines. And then we um, we went and we we got the industry to agree on it. And then we went and held it up. So we had protocols to our members didn't have to feel like it was on them to say, I don't want to go in that room. They could say my union saying it's not allowed. So we, yeah, it was really important. We had four pillars 
um, that we wanted to really work on when it came to uh, what was going on to really focus. We wanted to make sure we did outreach and education. We wanted to establish the rules and the guidelines. We um, wanted to find how we can do uh, intervention through legislation. That was important for us. And we also wanted to really build bridges um, with other organizations because we knew we couldn't do it alone. So that was our focus. We had to have like a, a, a mission statement. We did that. And then we really started working on where the issues lay. When we started asking members, because I looked at it as president, when it first came up, and I, I had had stuff happen to me as an actor when I was younger, but I never put it out there, right? I just thought it was something I had to work with and deal oh. with. So once it came out, we had to start really asking questions. Most of the members, in fact, when I look back, they hadn't reported to us. So what was that? What was that miss for us? That misstep where people didn't feel or recognize they could come out to us. So we had to go and create a reporting system. Then we went in to do, like I said, the guidelines. Then we had... Um, we worked on where a lot of people have experiences, like I said, with legislation, we worked very closely in Washington and in California and in New York. We really tried to work and still are working on legislation. But what we also did was um, we started realizing that a lot of a lot of vulnerability occurs with intimacy scenes. And so that's the that's when we started working with the intimacy coordinators. That was something that existed in theaters, but not in film or TV. And so um, we started working with established intimacy coordinators from stage and training and then bringing together all the different intimacy coordinators that were, um, you know, around and started having them design what a strong set would look like, a safer set would look like. And they, we had, we actually just helped to support them in the design of the protocols of what would be required because you wanted people to actually be uh, trained to be intimacy coordinators. It could be dangerous to have somebody come off the street and say, I'm an intimacy coordinator and they have no training. Maybe they're themselves a pervert, right? Exactly. I mean, yeah. So, so we had to put something in. We wanted to establish uh, a set of rules and protocols for intimacy coordinator standards that they created. We want to enforce that so that we can help build the uh, cadre there's not that many. So now there's more, a whole training and a cadre of intimacy coordinators. So ultimately every set will have uh, intimacy coordinators. And people in the beginning were like, you have to mandate it. And you said, you can't mandate what doesn't exist. Exactly. And you would think that it exists, right? It, it didn't exist. And people kept saying, but you should have to make it mandatory. So that you have to have training and you have to know what that looks like. I mean, people forget sometimes that it's a, if, if it's been hundreds of years, how do you go and create a structure that will be sustainable and effective and last the test of time? And so we worked on that. And those are some of the things that we did. And it's ongoing. We have incredible members. We've done, and you'll see, I sent to you earlier, and if you put it up, some of the links where people can go and get information on if you're shooting a project, you know, the things that you can do um, to make sure that the camera is not looking at your crotch. I mean, there are definite steps that you can take and there are, are ways that you can reach out. And so we've tried to really educate the members on what their rights are and how they can take care of themselves. In turn, we've also ha had it so that there was always an emergency number that you can call now on sets. That was important, not just for actors, but for the directors, for the crew, for the, the whole team needs to feel safe. And so, um, I think that I'm hoping that what we've helped to create and build and it continues to grow will help people feel more empowered. I think it's been effective and I think it'll be better as time goes on. Yes, I mean, it's like having a gun on set. It's it's just as, you know, that, that kind of damage, a gun will tear through your skin. Being violated on a set will tear through your skin. Oh, it's terrible. And it's so distracting. I mean, if you've ever had to do an intimate scene. I remember I had a, a director who said to me, Gabrielle, can, uh, I just, I think you're great. Can you just take your bra off? Cause he wanted to, oh. and, and how do you say in front of everybody? I, I'm so uncomfortable. I mean, I just had a baby and I said, I, I've been breastfeeding. I'm like, I was like, and saying this in front of men and it's just, there's just, okay. there was no support system there for me to say to somebody, can you help me through this? This is uncomfortable for me. I'm feeling really you know, I didn't, 
I, I think that we need to have a place to share and have somebody who can help us through that. And it's that's why it's really important the things that have been put forward and for us to keep listening to each other, to bear witness when you see something, say it, that you see it, stand up for that person so they don't feel alone. I mean, there's so many things that people don't necessarily think of that it's really important to do. It's interesting. We implemented this, you know, through PETA for animals, mm. you know, so that we, I mean, we, they were killing horses back, you know, one by one, it didn't matter or dogs or whatever. And now it took this long for, for women, you know, and men to, you know, on a set to feel safe, you know, so it's, it's and amazing. Men, you're right. Yeah, it, it's amazing what you've done um, and the accomplishments that you've, you you and your fellow everybody um, what you're doing. It takes everybody, right? So, so awesome. what's your advice though to someone that they need help? So we put some of those those hotlines, so to speak, in the um, and phone numbers inside of the chat. But is there a step that you would say if someone is, let's say, sexually harassed on a set? Well, first of all. If something happens where it's egregious, something that you really feel vulnerable, your first place that you can always call it, it is the police. I mean, I, I really want to say law enforcement, we are not, none of us are equipped to be law enforcement people. So that is a definite place to go where there's more understanding now than ever before. So that's one place to go. I think that um, if you're on set and something happens, there is an emergency number that should be available to you for you to call. You should also be able to call your representation if you have that person say, I need you, to, I need an out. I need you to come here right now. If you're on a union set, you call the union, there's a hotline, you can call it 24 seven and they will go and make sure to bring somebody on set. And if you don't feel safe, the first thing they'll say is leave the set. So you are much more powerful um, in your choices than you may realize. And I think that that's the most important. So those are some of the things that you can do. There's hotlines to call. Clearly, um, if it's something that's happening on set, there's clearer lines to that when you're not on set, when it's an audition room. That's where you might, you know, if, if it's for a certain job, you could even call the studio and say, I want you to know that in casting, this is going on. But I would go to your resources, your team that's around you to help you. And if it's something, again, like I said, that's really egregious, please go to the police. I mean, we can't, it will not change if we do not speak up. That's really, and I know that's hard. I want, I don't say that lightly. Yes. I know that's hard. Very hard. But I mean, I love that you're saying go to the police because somebody at work might not do something about it, but that's it's right. the police will do something, or at least the person will know that They've, it's been a report. You, know. you have to report it. But I'll tell you this, you do have one of the things that we put in place in our protocols, and that's in our contracts now. If you're doing any kind of audition for any, anything that it's uh, an intimate scene or if it's uh, hyper exposed, you are allowed to bring somebody of your choice to be in that audition with you. And I would say, I would encourage you, you never have to be alone. You can always bring a support person with you. It's see, I don't, I did not know that. So that, I mean, just that alone could make so many people feel so much safer, oh, um, especially so much, there's so much nudity now in the industry. Oh, and think about how it, for a young person, you know, we think that, and, and young men, it's hard for them. They're embarrassed to say they're embarrassed because yes. it's not cool, right? And oh. you're supposed to just show up and do it. And you're just into, that's not how it is. It's, they feel vulnerable and forget just intimate scenes where it's, sex what about we talk about um intimacy coordinators work some of them are therapists or have been trained so what if you're playing somebody who's a pedophile and that is the antithesis of who you are that's an emotional journey right to have somebody you can talk to beforehand about that what are some of the things you know this is how i'm feeling what if it's a child and how do you talk to them you need to have a safe word oh, yes. you need to be able to know that you're we need to be communicating with each other. And there that's why we have these systems in place because then people don't feel alone when they have to go through them. Exactly. Yes. I just, uh, I, it's so important to have, especially with children, someone on the set at all times that is legally supposed to be there to protect them. So you, if you're going to have it for a child, you want it all the way up. Um, for everybody. Everybody. 
okay, so going back to the start of your career um, and in you, you playing Andrea Zuckerman on um, Beverly Hills 90210. I just love saying Beverly Hills 90210. Growing up with that, you know, uh, it, how did that shape your perspective on the entertainment industry? Well, first, I mean, I, I loved it. It changed my life. So that uh, let me say that. That was a great experience. Um, what I did learn in yeah. being there is that um, we as women were paid differently than the men. And so that came to note for me as an ensemble cast when um, I was actually, something had taken place, Luke Perry and I had been asked to um, uh, oversee uh, an organization called Noxima Extraordinary Teens. We were supposed to be able to, you know, be a part of this program. And they said, you know, Gabrielle, would you like to do it? And they'd offered me, and I knew the boys were paid more than the girls. But um, they offered me at that time, and I'm going to tell money because I just want you to hear the extreme. Yeah. They said, I said, well, you know, I was working a lot at that time. I, I had a baby. It was just a lot. They, and on weekends, and they said, Gabrielle, would you do this? I, how much, you know, are you going to pay me? And they said $5,000. And I was, I talked to my husband and I said, you know, this was about four days of work and I had to go do some judging. And I, I said, you know what? I really thank you, but I'm just not going to do it. Well, we'll pay you 15,000. I was like, wow, that came like that fast. They said, really? 15? Well, no, no, I, now I know that Luke's getting paid a whole lot more money because I didn't even have to like, that's just not, no, I'm not going to do it. We'll give you 30,000. Well, all right. I said to my husband, I'm going to take this job. So the next year they, it came back again, but Luke didn't want to do it. And so they said, well, you want to do Gabrielle? And I said, well, how much are you going to pay me? They said, well, we're going to pay you the same amount that we paid last time, 150,000. Because I found out that Aaron Spelling was taking that money and keeping, and and he only gave me that much, you know, 30,000 versus what he'd given to Luke. And what I realized in that moment was that we were actually, there was a situation occurring in terms of financial differences. So that was upsetting. I also went to the cast and I said to them at the time, these are the things I've learned, right? I said at the time, um, you know, I think that there's some money that's being hidden. And I think that we need to do an audit. And if I do an audit, I'll be fired. But if we do it as a team, we're going to be, in, I think, a much better place. And Luke and Jason, those guys really took it to do it. And we actually settled. There was a lot of money that was taken. But what I learned in that moment was that there was a real pay discrepancy. And it was when we did the reboot of uh, 90210 three years ago, I talked to the cast before that saying, I'll only do it if we are all paid the same exact amount of money. Amazing. And that's, but that's what I learned. I learned to use my voice because I, I'm not one to look at, I think if you're happy with what you get paid, be happy with what you get paid. So I don't like to be competitive and I don't ask, but what I've learned also is we need to be able to share. We need to be able to say, look what's going on here for me, what's going on for you. Let's stand together, right? Because if that money exists, everybody should be reaping the benefits of it, not just one, you know, individual. So that's the stuff that I learned. And I learned, I learned to speak out and I learned sometimes to, you know, do things that, you know, take a stand in a way maybe that was uh, going to get me in trouble, but it was something that was worth it but you're so smart, my God, <laughs> that you actually were like, wait a minute, I can't do this by myself, but I can do this with all of us. So you're, you're pretty brilliant there. Um, was... <laughs> we, we, ha we have a, a, a clip that we're gonna show, if that's okay, it's just real mm -hmm. quick. Um, Nicole's gonna put it up for us. It's, um, I saw this post on TikTok the other day and I, I fell more in love with you as a human um, it, you, it had to do with you walking this tightrope, which is such a metaphor for life in general, but, um, you were, you were, sh you were told not to, to hug Alfonso and, and I'm going to just show the clip and it, you explain it perfectly. I don't need to go on, but I, I just, I have a question after we show it real quick. And this is just brilliant. For months and months and for the dress rehearsal, the network came to watch us. This is really fun, but it's also um, the scariest thing I've ever done. Alfonso, because he had done such a great job in making me feel safe, I gave him a big hug. And the producers said, that was unbelievable, Gabrielle. 
tomorrow when we, you know, do it live, the only thing we're going to ask is, please don't hug Alfonso. And I said, but why? And they said, well, you know, he's black and you're white. And middle America, I got to tell you, middle America is blamed for everything, everything. And they said they don't want to see, uh, you know, they can't accept that. And so I was so pissed that I said, oh, of course. And so I told Alfonso. And I said, so tomorrow when we do the show, I'm going to kiss you. And so when we did the show, I did. Even the ones. Absolutely bravo. I, I just, I'm sorry. Like everyone's clapping. Like that was, that was amazing. You have done this. You've been this advocate for diversity um, for so long. And, you know, it's just well documented, especially in that moment. And after watching you, I realized you always found the importance to champion these causes. And I just want to know, like, where did you get that from? Where did that come from? First of all, I, uh, my mom was a strong force, but I will say I, it's, it's not that I'm a champion. I, I would love to think that's what it is. I think that I just can't stand injustice. I cannot I cannot breathe when I see it. And I doesn't mean I'm perfect. I I learn and I try to be better. And but I when I see something, I really, you know, maybe it's the child in me who refuses to accept that we're anything less than the best of who we can be. And I just, when I hear certain things, it breaks my heart. I feel like it is unacceptable where we are in this country right now and what we're being faced with is unacceptable. This is not who we are. It is not the, the base of which our country and our who we, what we're supposed to be about was built on. And, and if we do not stand up, if we do not as individuals do even the littlest things, then, then we are hopeless. That it takes all of us to do, there is no small act. We must do everything we can. And I cannot say, honest to God, it's it's not, it's not because I. I think I'm going to change the world or whatever. I just think that we have to use our voices. And I, it hurts me when I see people being treated unfairly. It doesn't matter who they are. That is such a powerful TikTok clip. And I'm, I mean, and not to mention- My kids sent it to me. I didn't even know. They sent it. I was like, oh my God. I was just blown away. And I was like, oh my gosh. And that you did that at such a young age. Like, just your guts, you know, and, and when you do sit at the table and you are quiet when there is injustice and you know that there's injustice, it's so cruel. It's well, just not okay. You're being cruel just by being silent. Well, and you, we are actually participating in the cruelty, right? Uh, it's, it's bigger than that. We are, by saying nothing, we actually contribute to its existence. A pet yes. And, they said it during World War II when, you know, for those who stood silent, they were complicit in the act by standing silent. You have to have a voice. You have to say something. And as uncomfortable as it is. So on that particular subject, I watched your TED Talk. Um, it had a little bit to do with ageism, but it also had to do with a particular, um, uh, you know, you had a fight against the age bias. Um, but can you share some insights and strides that you made for changing that, you know, that, and that you had to face that. Right. I, not just me, it's, there's been changes, you know, actually, so the IMDB law, I'll tell you this, it, it was being worked on years beforehand in our union. People were trying to get IMDB to uh, change their practices. And then when it came to me coming into uh, the presidency, I went to see Governor Brown and we passed the law the, for IMDB. And then they went and um, countersued. And so then it was not countersued. They went and um, they wanted to go and retry it so that it made it so it became null and void. And it was just Fran Drescher, who's the president now, who went to IMDb and actually closed the loop on it. So I think that um, the one thing I've learned through my service is that um, we build, right? That's why everything we do here today, whether it changes today, it is a step for tomorrow. 
and that we can't lose heart. I remember when it first came up and I, you know, the law passed and then we lost it. And somebody said to me, well, a lot of good your work did because it doesn't matter. And I was like, you're wrong. It matters. And I will never give up trying. And I think that's for all of us. Don't lose heart. We just have to keep stepping forward and that will pave the path. And if it's not going to be us, then it'll be somebody the next time. But we have to open the doors for them. We have to hold it open and be mighty and, and hope for the best. But that was a really, um, it was, I have to tell you, that was the one thing being president of SAG-AFTRA, fighting for other individuals. I learned to fight for myself. And I learned where I never, things I hadn't said earlier, maybe that would have made a difference. I learned to say at that time. And I also recognize the things I like, you know, when you shared the clip, I was like, oh, there's things that I did that were, they were the right ways to go. It was an important step, right? So being in leadership actually was so humbling because I also was faced with so many people who really, there are outstanding individuals who are making a difference every single day. And it is truly humbling to be around them. What you're doing, truly humbling, great work. Thank you. Oh, well, um, I have just a couple more questions. Um, many admire your unwavering commitment to creating um, equitable opportunities for Spanish speaking writers and performers within the WGA and SAG-AFTRA. Um, and I know even the directors, um, uh, the, the, um, the, the directors. Okay. DGA. Yeah, DGA. Um, how can we help support our fellow writers right now and our actors and our directors oh, in the okay. industry. Are you talking about inclusion right now? Or are you talking about the strike that we should all I be working on? All, the strike and, and what's and what's coming. I mean, I you know, I don't know if uh, there's so many people that are talking now and I'm hearing all these whispers of that there's gonna be another strike with within SAG and within the 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 DGA. And so, you know, a lot of us are sitting back and saying, you know, how do we, how do we support? What do we do? How can we help? I think that this is a fight. Uh, so I'll say being the president of FIA, right? The Federation, International Federation of Actors, but it's FIA. Um, being, this is a global issue. Right now, the fight that you see the writers going through in regards to streaming, what's taking place, um, is a fight that the DGA is going to have, but it's their formula is a little different, but it's definitely a fight that SAG after members are going to have. This is an important time. I just did an interview with um, Australia because they're saying, you know, how's the writer strike is going to, how's it going to affect us? And the truth is, even if they're not working under globally, working under our contracts, they are all experiencing streaming and the, uh, the lack of fairness of what's how the distribution of uh, money is going out. Yeah. They are watching on a global level this strike. So I would say to everybody, whether you are a member of a union or not, if you are a director, if you are a writer, if you are an actor, if you are whatever role you play, or even not inside our industry, please stand and walk with the writers because what they're doing right now will actually affect our industry for decades to come. This is this is the time when people are going to are going to lose their homes and they are willing to lose their homes because if we don't change this now it will be truly the demise of um of a career and it'll become a hobby and this is not a hobby industry there are people who made great livings in this industry the pay dis the pay now is so different even for the people you think are making tons of money because of the way streaming is and how it's shorter, you know, you have shorter seasons now and you're being held for, you know, two to two and a half years at a time, not being able to work on anything else. These are very, very important uh, issues at hand. And I say, walk, go out there, find out where it's happening, write to the studio, say, make it, do the right thing, do the right thing and, um, and just pay attention. And if you are a union member, vote. The, let's talk about pay because you were just talking about pay and um, and gender parity in the industry. From your vantage point, what changes have you seen when it comes to to this? We're still it's not just in our industry; it's in every industry. There's this it is this 
equity, it's just equity is not there for women, even when it comes to um, funding our films. I mean, we are down here. It is. I, I'll tell you, it's not only for women and the disparity is terrible. So there are so many different organizations uh, working and fighting for uh, equity. But I, I would like to go even further than that. As a white woman who's paid less than a white male, a woman of color is paid far less than you're paid or I'm paid. So if you were to talk about the pecking order of what goes on, you have, you know, the white male, the white female, the black woman, the Latino or light skinned you know, woman, that pay disparity that goes down over and over again, it is unbelievable. So there are different ways to fight that. We have to acknowledge it. There are things that have been done, you know, with what's your name, Michelle? Maybe one of you guys know. Yeah. No. Say again. Michelle, she was, oh gosh, with Wahlberg in the movie, remember, and they recast the movie because, and she was, she found out when they redid the casting for it. Michelle, does everybody know what I'm talking about? Anyway, she, um, she was offered to reshoot. I remember this. Right. And she was offered $5,000 to reshoot. She was going to do it. Mark, War Wa Mark Wahlberg was offered a million dollars, both leads. That went public. And that pay disparity is shocking. That went public to show what exactly what happened. Two leads, one ma male, one female, both very, Michelle Williams, both yeah. very well respected. And yet it somehow, it, same agent allowed for that pay disparity. That is something that reverberates constantly throughout our industry. So the best thing to do is, again, you know, people who are in leadership roles actually have the ability to say, no, I, it, there has to be equity. If you look at Friends was brilliant when they did that years and years and years ago, when they stood together and they said, it's all of us or none of us. That was uh, um, Schwimmer is the one who went and made that happen. He, they wanted to give him a certain amount. And he said, no, it has to be for everybody. And he held out and they did it as a cast together. Again, this is about you know, how our strength comes in our unity. But um, the, there is incredible pay disparity within our industry, within our country, within our world. And the way to do it is to actually, again, we have to tell each other. We have to share what's going on. It goes out public. That's where things change. The yeah. public doesn't want to see that. And, um, and because it's difficult, our contracts are set up where they are actually gender neutral when you have, because it's base pay. But when you go in to negotiate above that base pay is where you start to see. And of course, if you have an agent who can go and negotiate better for you, you don't want people to be denied that. But there can't be a pay disparity amongst people of color or people who are women versus men. There has to be, there's got to be a standard. And we just have to keep speaking out about it. But it, there is really, there is still incredible inequities that go on. And I think we're always shocked, but I don't know why we're surprised. Yeah. Well, I think what's so shocking is that we still allow it. We're allowing this to happen. So because we don't tell, there's too much silence around it. It's until you knew about Michelle Williams, until it went public, it would have remained the same. It would have remained the same. So as long as we're quiet and silent, things will not change. Yeah. I mean, even when it comes to the editing, you know, I recently had we had a panel of editors that talked about. What is fair pay? What, what does an experienced editor versus a non-experienced versus mm -hmm. an assistant make? That was the first time I'd ever heard anybody even talk a little bit about the actual pay. Because mm -hmm. if you don't know, because usually editors in the past have been men. So mm -hmm. to, to be able to hear what the numbers are, um, and then also just to know that we don't have to put up with it that we can do something about. Right. Um, so, okay, finally, before we go to Q&A, because I know everybody's got a lot of questions for you and I've kind of sucked up all your time. Um, <laughs> you've had, you have this beautiful family, you've worked hard, you have such an amazing career and you're undoubtedly, you're a big force in the entertainment industry and as an activist. Looking forward, what would you like your legacy to be? Oh my God, you know what? I, I, 
I don't know. I hope that um, I I hope that I am able to be remembered for working to help lift people up, to be to be taken care of, to be protected. My legacy. I guess my legacy would be partly what I did for as the president of the union as a as a woman. I don't. I just you know. Our response was, and my mom used to say, our response, the responsibility of every individual is to make a difference in the world. So I hope in my legacy somewhere I did that. That's what I, I hope. I hope that I, my legacy will be remembered as, you know, I made it a safer, safer place in, to live. I think you definitely have. And I think you're an inspiration. And I think you're definitely going to leave the world a little bit better place than, than it is now, for sure. Um, I'd like to open it up now to questions from our audience. Some people write things. Yeah, that's all we can hope for is to try and do the right thing, right? Mm. Um, does anyone have a question for Gabrielle? And our STEAM board chair, Amy Zenz, will be reading our questions in the chat. Or if you would rather, you can um, raise your hand. So we're, we're asking you to raise your hand. Um, we extend our sincere appreciation to you. So, you know, let's just open it up for some other people to have some time to be able to ask their questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Julie, for wonderful moderating and Gabrielle for a wealth of information. Um, actually, Hillary Dunn had a couple questions that were in the chat, but I'll let her go ahead and ask those directly. Hey, um, Thanks for taking time to speak with us today. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could elaborate a little bit about the IMDb role I <clears throat> changed. Um, I actually wasn't aware of it, so I'm curious what that work was that you did there. So IMDb has a thing where, you know, you have the, the public site and then the site you pay for. So you can go mm -hmm. and a lot of that's used for casting. And so what happens is and in the upper left hand corner, it used to have your age. And we wanted the ability to opt out to have our ages taken off because subconsciously whether, and this was one of the things I talked about when I was in Sacramento is that even though you say you don't care about the age, I can look at a picture and then look, oh, there's, they're 50. Yeah, they're too old for that. It's a subconscious bias. And so um, we went to change the law so that people could go and opt out of having their ages shown, even though you can find it on the rest of the internet, this is a site that's used for casting. And we said when doctors, there's doctor sites for hiring, there's lawyer sites, age discrimination is illegal. You're not allowed to post ages or ask. And yet on the sites where we work, not just as actors, but people who are camera people, you know, crew, their ages are shown and it's a discriminatory uh, process. So I went to fight to have that taken off. Thank you. I definitely have mine hidden. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, is it okay if I ask my second question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Um, so I was curious if the unions are um, doing any work sort of proactively towards limiting um, the degree to which AI and CGI can be used to replace uh, living talent and creators. Yes, so one of the things in my presidency is we created a uh, um, a technology uh, work a committee. And we literally have been going to the Consumer Electronics Show CES for years and years and years and years to watch the development of technology. And I went to, uh, we've worked on laws. We're working in actually not just in California, but we work in Washington with other uh, people in the industry, DGA and Writers Guild as well, and the studios to fight some of the technology or to create laws and structure around the technology. And um, I, as being a part of the AFL-CIO, I actually did the future of work. I was the chair with Liz Schuler, who's the president. And um, we went to bring in other industries to look at the technology because what happened was people were saying, you know, you can't allow, it's, it should be illegal, you shouldn't allow the technology because it's going to take away jobs, but you can't stop the technology. What we can do is look to, in our contracts, we have language, and we're working on language even more because now you're seeing, you know, the, 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 the explosion of technological advances that are taking place. We already have 
uh, language in our contracts. We're getting deeper into stronger language around the new technologies where you can't just go and you know take somebody's image. You saw maybe uh, you might be aware of the time. Um, oh, with Carrie Fisher, you know how she was. Yeah. She, they took her after she died. Took her image and her voice, and they were able to create the character to live through the whole film as if she was still alive. That was all done through the AI technology. We fight um, through um, deep fakes, which you know we've been dealing with it in the industry for a long time, where they take a celebrity's face and they put it on a, a, a naked body, there's pornography done. And so we mm -hmm. worked on laws and have helped to pass laws regarding uh, deep fakes. We do a lot of education and reach out to our members and people who aren't members. We're telling people, don't sign away your rights. Don't allow people to say, I'd like to go and um, you know, take, take your image and will you sign it away so I could use that for what in perpetuity. Never, ever, ever sign away your image. So if you're a union member, you could always reach out to the union and they can look at your contract clauses to make sure because those are added in sometimes. If you're not, just never sign away your rights because once you do, you can't get it back. And they are creating libraries right now with our voices, with our images. You saw what they can do with chat, GDP, uh, GT, GP, chat. GPT. GPT, thank you. <laughs> you saw that with, and they can write scripts. And that's in the rawest form now. Can you imagine what it looks like down the road? That's something that the writers are dealing with right now. We don't want, they don't want to see, There's. they don't want to be, uh, looked at after the fact. They want to be a part of the process. So there are, are, are laws that we're trying in contracts, rules we're trying to get put into place, legislation that we're trying to work on. This is uh, something that we're facing. I said, you know, we should be talking, we should show the president, and you've seen maybe before, a long time ago, uh, Barack Obama, they showed when it was just beginning, um, having him say things that what, what he was saying. And you could tell but now you can't tell anymore. So we're trying to show what I said, what if we put Supreme Court for every judge and have them say things that they would never say publicly and put that up there because that will make them pass laws immediately to know that they're being uh, misrepresent misrepresented. So yes, we are working on it, but we have to fight hard, fight, fight hard for it. Thank you. Next, we have a question from Diane Walsh, our esteemed vice president of WIFPA SF, and also then next, Kelly, a board member. Hi, um, thank you so much for this talk. This has just been enlightening and challenging. And um, I wanted to ask you, um, we've taught, we always talk about women supporting women. And now that you know, the Me Too movement and everything has brought things out into the public. I was wondering what your impression is of men now who step up to support women and this happening, whatever sex, whatever, you know, whatever that may be, are they stepping up and is on set, on sets, do you feel there is a shift that it's not just women who notice these things, but that oh. men are becoming much more a part of this and not wanting it to continue? Such a good question. I, I actually want to say from the very beginning, um, and I had said this, don't think it's only women. It will take women and men together, good women, good men together to take a stand. And I think that we're seeing that. If we, if we only isolate it to depending on each other and not allowing it to be all of us together, then we really, we're not, we're in a lose-lose situation. So I think there are, are clearly great men in our industry who are actually stepping forward. Ryan Murphy is a perfect example. He has the half foundation that he created because he saw that even he had biases in terms of subconscious biases that existed, even his hiring practices. He tells a great story about um, when he did the, um, uh, uh, what's, uh, Betty, Joan and Betty, um, you know, yeah. Joe, and he actually had a female director. She fell out and he said, um, I really felt it should be a female uh, driven director who was there. He said, I looked, I couldn't find it. I didn't have time. I directed it, won awards and I felt ashamed because what I realized was I kept looking in the same places we always looked expecting to find something different. 
Instead of saying, I lost this director, instead of going to the same people, there are other access points that I haven't looked at. And so he, because of him and his realizing that, he created the HAF Foundation and now it's mandated on every set that he works on, it will always be 50-50, 50% men and 50% women. There are great, great organizations. If you look at um, Gina Davis and the work that she's done and the men that support her in that work. So yes, I do think there are great men stepping forward. There always have been great men. But now, because we're all public out there, you're seeing them stand up with us. And so it will take all of us to make the difference. And and on sets, for example, now, if there is a big pay, you know, disparagement, do you think it's more likely that a man who's getting, you know, X amount and a woman who's getting this amount would speak up more? Is there more support you know, for really that? It always depend on the person, isn't it? I mean, I can... Yeah. I can always tell you a good story and then I can always tell you a, a bummer of a story. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think that, you know, there's more awareness and there's there you hear some of the good stories more and we, maybe the more we hear them, the more people will try yeah. to emulate them. Yeah. You know, that's why we also want to share, right? Because um, as Gina Davis says, you have to see it to be it. And so we have to be able to see it so we can aspire to it. So I would say for everybody to share their stories, bad and good, um, good and bad. And that's how we'll really make the change as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Gabrielle. I just have to thank you so much for this talk. There are so many pieces that you touch that have to do with like my career and things I've experienced. And um, as a from starting this at a very older age, for one thing, I, I love like getting rid of ages or you know, trying to get rid of ageism. But um, as I produced one of my first shorts, I had a student director actually come to me and say that she wanted to hire an intimacy coordinator and she had found somebody and I was all for it. And after that one example, and it was for a sex scene and that intimacy coordinator was amazing. Uh, just totally changed the tone of the actor in the set because he was just a jokester, nice guy, but just a jokester. And I could just see where that scene would have gone if she wasn't there. And she was amazing. So I will always, always, always hire an intimacy coordinator. But what I like that you mentioned today is the fact that doing it for other things other than sex scenes, like some you know, things that they might be experiencing that's out of character for them. And I just thought that was enlightening. I didn't really think about that before. They, so, it's intimacy coordinators that taught me that actually. So it's. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I loved it. She was a former stunt woman. And mm -hmm. so she really knew angles and things and she was great. So that's I've got wonderful. her card if anybody needs her. No, <laughs> but, um, um, but the other thing I, you know, sometimes in the industry, this industry and others, but there's, you know, the overt sexual harassment and things like that. Any tips on the subtle ones? Like, for instance, I'm a producer and working with male producers on a project that's actually about women in the 60s who didn't get the chance to do what they were very capable of doing because they were women. And even in our meetings, we find, I have two other producing partners that are women and the three of us find sometimes the men are talking down to us or dismissing our opinion. And it's like, okay, you know, good for you. Like, not that obvious, they're really nice men and, and they're really wanting to tell this story about women, but they leave us out of so many things. Mm -hmm. Any suggestions or ideas on how to kind of combat that more subtle ways where these guys think that they're really helping the situation, but they're. Is there one that you're really uh, close to that you feel an affinity towards more than the others or comfortable in a way? We, yes. And I've tried to bring just a little awareness to him and he gets super defensive about it. So unfortunately. <laughs> well, I think that, you know, um, I, I actually, I, I don't know that doing it in a group would be fruitful, but you could, you know, mm -hmm. sit down together. You could sit down and say, let's have an open conversation. Some things you'd like to see from us. And we'd like to share what we'd like to see from you. There's some experience or just say, 
for not to, you know, in a, uh, about men versus women, just say, you know, as a team, this is a good time for us maybe to sit down. Let's talk about what's been working and what's a little uncomfortable. And then, you know, maybe to speak about a specific incident, you know, that came up and say, I just want you to know, I was feeling this way about this. And it's, I, I think it's really about finding that the willingness to communicate. If it's not something mm-hmm. that's blatant, I think that right. you know, there might be ways for you to really communicate and say, maybe we can have a word or there can be a something that we say, hold off for a moment or because we don't want to go and have animosity towards each other. Right. Uh, again, if you could do it one-on-one, but if you can't, you could do it where you might actually be hearing some things that you're doing and that you want, you know, that you'll have to take feedback on. But I think mm-hmm. that if, I don't know the dynamic of your group, but somewhere, somehow to find a way to communicate, I would recommend that would be a good way to do it. I think. And if there's something in the movie that you're doing to say, oh, that's so interesting. That reminds me of something the other day I hadn't thought of. I'd like to share that with you because, you know, sometimes we are reliving these situations over and over and we don't realize it. You can bring it up that way as well. Mm -hmm. I know one of our ways we're trying to find a stronger female, like a more experienced female producer to help guide us and lead us through it. So I know that that's not necessarily just the solution and to ignore it, but you know, so often these things are subtle, right? But I know it's very difficult. It's, but I think that you can guys can come. I mean, I don't know how close you all are, but you know, there could be a come to Jesus moment. Like, you know what, we got to air something out. We're going to just share it. We don't want anybody to feel like they have to comment on it. We just have to get it out there and, and like you to be able to sit on that and hear it. And then maybe we can talk later about it. Cause sometimes when people feel defensive, they feel like they have to shut it down like that. And you can just say, I just want to share this right now. And, you know, and then come back later and talk about it. Thanks. Thanks again for sure. Everything you've shared and everything you've fought for throughout the years. Cause I know it's been a lot of hard work and thank thankless often so thank you for all the fight you know that you've done thank you all right i don't know if i've missed any questions in the um audience i think i do i see one more so um while we're waiting for further questions i will take one from megan reeks actually hi um Oh, I guess I'll come off camera. I'm like greasy haired and everything, but um, <laughs> thanks for everything. Thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for your work thus far. Um, I am cultivating a community of women and non-binary writers over 40. Some are not quite there yet, but we're not carding anyone. And I just love to hear from you. Any advice you have? And also um, what as a performer would you love to see uh, in a role for yourself? Um, Cause we are also really trying to create roles for people that look like us uh, who are our age, who are at our life wisdom state. I, I think we have great stories to tell at our age, right? So I, I, I don't think you have to make anything up. I think I, you know, I've, I've been t- talking about this as well, not about producing a project necessarily like that, but just what do I wanna see? I, I think I would love to see women talking about their sexuality. I mean, the truth is men talk about it blatantly out there. And there is, you know, I was just talking to somebody about the fact about what about when you get divorced and you're older and you have, you know, you're sharing your body with somebody you've never, you know, knew before when you were younger. And how do you feel about yourself and how do you feel liberated in your sexuality? I think that's a conversation that we should be able to talk about. And I, I don't think we do as women. Um, but I think that uh, I don't know that I, I just want to hear the stories. I actually don't want to even make it about our age. I think I just want us on adventures. I want to see the power and the greatness of who we are, regardless of our ages. Our ages are just how many years we've been on the planet it has nothing to do with our humanity in terms of who we are and how we participate. I, I would much rather not make it about, you know, my age, but just, you know, the greatness of just being in the world and the struggles and whatever we go through, whatever they may be, we do that whether no matter what age we are. And so I think those are the real stories that I want to see. And I want to see women really celebrated for their greatness. You know, when um, it was uh, uh, National Geographic was doing the whole series on, they did a Picasso and they, you know, all the famous, it was all men. 
everybody that they were trying to recognize of in history who had done great things. Well, there have been great women in history, great women, great stories. When I ask them why they don't really talk about the women, they said, well, you know, their stories are painful. Well, you know, that's true. The stories were painful because they were fighting many elements other than just trying to accomplish the one thing they were working on. So I think we need to tell those truths. I think people have to see it. We cannot erase history. There are some in our country that would erase history because they don't want to see it, but we cannot be better if we don't know, if we don't pay attention and face what has been and what is. So I say, tell all the stories and they don't have to be pretty or they can be beautiful, whatever you want. Thank you. I just want to bring to people's attention a link that I put in the chat that goes to um, a summit that was produced by the Representation Project, Jennifer Cybell Newsom's pro um, production company that's addressing representation, sexism, um, and other many of the other isms within our society that manifest within the film and television industry. And they had a great state of the media summit recently, and six minutes and 33 seconds into it, so I put in the link, there is, they have actually a state of the industry report card that gives all of the stats and data regarding women in different positions, women over 50, which I was like, wow, that's what's considered older these days. Um, you know, um, uh, women who are fat, um, owning the, the term fat as opposed to overweight, which is a judgment as opposed to just, so all of these things about how we value and identify each other in our society and how we're represented. So I just want to encourage people to look at that also. And our next question is from Nicole Carlson, also a board member. Hi, thank you so much for everything tonight. Um, your list of accomplishments and all the stories that you've shared are so inspiring. I was just um, sitting thinking like, do you have thoughts on um, ways that we can get involved and help give back to women in our field aside from just the things that we can do on our own projects, but is there a path forward that you could suggest to um, get to those organizations that will affect change for a broader group? I'm not sure. So what I would say for, you know, I think that just bringing up Newsom's, the, 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 seminar that just took place is a great example. We should participate. This is a great example, what you guys are putting forward and, and talking and how to support each other. You know what? I think about um, mentoring is a great thing to do. I think it's very important. I, you know, I, I think we should be in the schools having these conversations and really encouraging young women and men to work together I think that, um, but joining other, I think if we can join other organizations that are like-minded, that's how we help each other. And when you hire people, look at, there is nothing better when you talk to people who've worked on an all-female set. People talk about the dynamic of being in an all-female set and how it is life-changing and life-affirming. You can do things like that. There has been sets that have only been men. So you can make it that your projects you know, focus on, be committed in your jobs and what you guys create of um, having equality, making sure that you have diversity, making sure that you have representation of people of different color, people with disabilities, people of different gender, gender identities. But I mean, if you can be inclusive, you walk that walk, then you also set the platform. So I, I think you could do it in the most basic ways and you can also join organizations that are doing that. Thank you so much. I love that you what you said that you you go every year to the technology convention. It's um, if you don't know what's happening, you can't implement change or have an opinion on it or hold these companies responsible for what's about ready to happen. And what's about ready to happen is happening, and it's not going to stop. Now, can there be regulation? Yes, but being able to understand that that probably is one of the biggest changes that we're going to go through. I mean, just, just even with the, um, the way TV is gone pretty much. And now we have TikTok and, you know, these, these are our new celebrities are these influencers, which have very little representation, which a lot right. of, them, you know, are, there's a lot of nudity 
there's a lot of there's and a lot of the the rights aren't being taken care of and then the way we're viewing is changed everything's changed it's the wild west right now and the technology and the ai is going we just had an ai um event last month mm -hmm. and what we've learned just from them on how to implement these positive ways of using ai within making our films and you know and then addressing the negative if we don't learn those kinds of things, we will become dinosaurs. And if we don't learn what the problems are and how to take them on, we are really going to have a problem on our hands. So I think, I think, Julie, it's true. It's not just that, but I'll say one of the things that when we first went to CES, the Consumer Electronics Show, when I put together the, the, um, the group that went out, we only had like, I, I want to say maybe, you know, 30 people. We now, this last time, we are a part of CES with labor, which is we because of our going there regularly, we've actually, we've had up to like, I think it was 700 people who came to be with us, but more importantly, we are actually sitting at the table with developers. So I think that it's not just about making laws, but it's actually helping people to understand that what they think is helpful could be very harmful. And they don't know that in the midst of this excitement of creating, they're just putting things out there, thinking they're there to help us. But if we're there at the table, really talking about what we need for help and why that could maybe be helpful or not helpful, I think starting in the very, if we can lean in, right? Great idea, lean in and be a part of that conversation early on, we can actually sidestep some of the issues that are occurring now because that was done in silos without actually our voices being included. And without women. A lot of them are, are without women. So we were talking about that too, being coded by men, being and, and being implemented by men. So I think it's, you know, going back to what you were saying in the very beginning, we have to keep talking about whatever the issues are. But one of the most important issues that's about ready to hit the entertainment industry in the face, well, it is hitting them in the face, is AI. And so, you know, I really wanted us to talk about it in our last meeting because I just felt like as scary as this all is, if we don't talk about it, we are going to have, you know, we have the WGAs marching in the streets right now, but we're not talking about AI in our group. And so we, we started talking about it. And, you know, one of the things, um, one of our member, one of our board members, uh, Neil, she gave us this really great talk on YouTube from the, the guys that did this social dilemma. And I put it in um, like a, 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 a whole bunch of articles and then gave that as well to watch. And it was so frightening, but at the end of it, it was so positive because it was saying how that movie, um, The Morning After, right. was a, it was a film. And it was, a film that was watched by so many people throughout the entire world. And at the end of watching it, the, all the heads of states and governments came together and they, you know, made all these changes to uh, nuclear uh, energy. And so that we wouldn't have a complete disaster on our hands um, and have the morning after. And to me, you know, I was saying in our last meeting, film can change the world for the better. And if we're using some of these and knowing how to use them that aren't going away, these AIs, um, then we can, as filmmakers, we have this arsenal, we are strong and we have the ability to make positive things so that if you can see it, you can be it and get these messages across. So I think it's really, really important that we okay. realize okay. that that is our next gigantic, you know, as Neil said, the elephant in the room. Well, you know, it's not, so, it's right there, right? You had the industrial revolution and now we're here in the technology revolution. And this revolution will happen much more quickly where it took a hundred years for their transformation. This will not be, it will happen within the next five years. Already what we've seen, but certain things will be cemented in and that's why it's so important to deal with it right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a different kind of harassment. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, Technology, I always say, is meant to serve us. We're not meant to serve it. And if we don't pay attention and we let it slide, then it's to our detriment. Because you're seeing right now people who are, you know, top 
uh, creators from Google and you know Microsoft coming together, talking in Washington about the dangers of the technology that's at hand because people are not paying attention necessarily. They're so excited by the, oh, look what I can do. I can go and, you know, just, you know, program this in, or I can say this and it's going to say all these things for me. And they're young people are really not understanding because it's so fun. And, but we have to remember that there is something to it. You know, you take a phone and you know how you can go and put your image to see how your hair looks different. They have those different apps that you're sent. Remember they're taking your image and owning your image. I mean, we're not thinking about really what that potentially means. And they're taking our facial gestures and they're learning to make, so that's, you can't stop all of that, but you have to know what's going on. You, you need to pay attention to it. And then we need to make sure that we take a stand about it. But it is really where people say, it's not my issue. I'm a writer, I'm an actor, I'm a director. No, you're a human being. You're a participant in this planet. And these are things that will, affect you and everybody else. So pay attention to that as well, because it's important. Well, and if you're making content for your Instagram or for your brand, you are part of, you're, you're now a filmmaker. Right. So, you know, you, you're part of this ecosystem. And right. so I think it's really important that, you know, we figure out how to hold the top tier companies um, responsible before there's really, you know, heinous things that end up happening. Um, so, and, and there are things already happening. So we're gonna have to continue that conversation. Amy, are, is there any other questions? There is, Diane has another question. Yes, and actually it's, it's a nice segue because you brought up young people and kind of their excitement and having fun with this. Um, I just retired from teaching 20 years in higher ed, uh, running a film and television writing program back in Philly and um, working with the film department, the animation department. I mean, you know, everybody uh, working in terms of creating and all the various levels. I was wondering if the unions are really looking to reach out to higher ed. This is the next generation coming up who are going to be creating more and more software, more and more things that are going to be impactful, as well as having and directing on sets and producing and storytelling and all of those things. I was wondering if there is a concerted effort or plan to reach out. I think the you know, all the, in LA, USC, UCLA, they're in the fold right there. You know, they're all right there in New York maybe, but there's, you know, our universities up here, Mm -hmm. We're in tech land. So there's a whole other kind of look at the responsibility of tech here. So is there some effort to reach out to higher ed universities yes. and talk to this about this? Yeah, you're in Philly. Is that what you no, said? I'm I, I was in Philly. I taught there. I'm back in I'm in San Jose. I'm up here in the Bay Area now. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So are you asking for San Jose? You're talking about in San Jose then? We're I'm talking about in general. Gen yeah. So uh, what I'll say is because depending on your the loca location, yes. Okay. The, the unions actually have programs going into higher ed and you can actually ask them to come in to speak. Um, ah. And so it would be, um, you know, you would call the headquarters of DGA or, uh, you know, I'm sure Writers Guild has something. I, I'm not aware of it. I just know DGAs and I know SAG-AFTRA has uh, different things that they can do programming. And we also, um, there are things also on our website. You don't have to be a member to go onto the website. So there's information coming out all the time about what's going on in terms of technology in our industry. So people could go to sagaftra.org. That's S-A-G-A-F-T-R-A.org. And they can look up articles um, that have come out in the past. There's some talks we do. Um, podcast. So um, when I was president, I hosted the podcast and we did stuff with AI. And now um, we have uh, uh, Ben Whitehair, who's the national executive uh, vice Pre president, and Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who is now the NED. And they do podcasts with people in technology. They um, And Duncan, actually, who's really uh, special, but he he's very in touch with technology and actually uh, and connected to it. And he's, there have been interviews done with people who are in the technology field that you can go and listen to those. So there is definitely access places 
for people in, high, people in higher education to be able to look, but there are also programs. You can ask for maybe somebody to come speak um, at your school based on, you know, at a school um, of students based on what the topic you want. You can call the union to see if they have somebody and they might be able to help you there. Um, that's great. Um, sometimes, and it depends on the people who are obviously running the programs about how uh, proactive they are about finding things. And so I'm just suggesting that maybe there's a way that the unions can target. They know, do. Just, they do. They have programs with the schools. I just don't know. They reach out to them. They reach yes. Out? Okay. And some of them are based on connections. So if there's a school that doesn't have it, you could always ask them. Okay. Somebody will have to reach out to them, right? Because the the union yeah. actually is very active um, in all. We call them locals. So around the country, the different locals. Some are more active in certain locals than others. So if you're wanting that and you don't have it at your school, somebody will need to reach out to the union to ask for that kind of support. Mm -hmm. Besides tech, are they also, um, again, some of the, the Me Too area in terms of how to be on a set, how to create a set, these young filmmakers who are learning how to yes. so, be, so is, is it similar? Or do you have things like that for higher yeah, education? For the acting classes, but for the if you're for looking, filmmaking, like for filmmaking departments to if to the be departments aware of ask that. for it, there are certain ones that I know have gone out, but I can't say they're doing that around the country. And I think that, uh, but because it exists, even if they don't have, let's say in the local that you might be talking about, let's say they don't have a large presence in that local, but maybe the uh, writers uh, department does, or they can maybe refer you to somebody who will be able to do that. Also. Um, and you're right, not everybody takes the initiative. You can't, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the only focus for the union, but absolutely, yeah. it is one of the things we talk about all the time in terms of the only way to, we have to make sure we call them pre-union or yeah. POPs, pre-union uh, uh, performers. That's so perfect. <laughs> uh, so we actually do reach out to the pre-union people, knowing that they should know about their supports. And we do that when you talk about um, influencers. We actually created a thing for influencers representation because we see that they really are being abused and their images are being held in perpetuity uh -huh. they get hired for something they might not ever be able to do something else so we're really looking to help protect them on that cool thank you thank you so i think uh, uh, how amy do we have any last questions I do not see any more in the chat. Well, we're getting close to ending. So I just want to extend our sincere appreciation to all of our audience tonight and a heartfelt thank you to Gabrielle um, for her invaluable insight and remarkable dedication to improving our world. Um, your efforts have made a lasting impression on us all and this crucial moment in history where our collective actions can bring about significant change promoting quality and safety for everyone and shaping the future for our society. It requires people like you, Gabrielle, who fearlessly stand for justice and for what's right. And let's continue the conversation and confront our fears together. Uh, thank you so much for joining us tonight, Gabrielle. Uh, your courageous spirit and your compassion and your heart have deeply touched all of us. And um, I think we're a little bit better for it uh, that, that you came tonight. Uh, just lastly, we'd like to add a chat, any a helpline um, for harassment. And um, there's a bunch of different links there. There's also a movie called She Said that we're giving the link to the trailer if you might be interested. And we just want to thank everybody again for coming tonight, especially Gabrielle. Um, again, you have really, you've touched our hearts and our minds and you have us all inspired to go out and do great things and not be afraid. So thank you very, very, very much. I'm really, really very appreciative. I think you guys are great. Thank you for your work. Really appreciate it. Honored to be here. Thank you. Have a good night, everybody.